Hi, everyone. Welcome to Things We Said Today. I'm Darren DeVivo uh, from WSUV Radio in New York City. And with me for this special edition of Things We Said Today is my good friend, Alan Cozen. Alan, uh, accomplished writer, journalist, critic, the co-author of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, covering the years 1969 to 1973, hard at work at Volume 2 as we speak. Alan's here, but you might notice that Ken's not. Uh, Ken sitting sitting one out. Um, he's meeting with his parole officer, so, you know, shh, don't tell anyone. I'm kidding. But Alan, it's great to have you here for what should be a special conversation. Great to be here. Yeah. Well, uh, today, uh, in this special Thanksgiving week program that we have for you, uh, author and... I wouldn't say he's a playwright. He's a theater producer. He's produced the theatrical musicals on Broadway. Um, Vivek Tiwari is our very special guest. Now, it was 10 years ago that Vivek uh, wrote a graphic novel called The Fifth Beetle, the Brian Epstein story. And you will hear me say Epstein and Epstein numerous times throughout the show because we recorded this interview about a month ago. Now, Alan is uh, modeling the... That's the first pressing you have, right? The first print. This is the original edition, right. the vintage, the vintage edition. <laughs> and that now is ten years old and is being re-released. What do you do when you reissue a book? And I'm used to music gets re-released. A book gets republished. I don't know. I guess reissued. I mean, and it comes with, uh, you know, it's got a new cover. It's got a in, uh, a new intro. It's got new sort of uh end materials it's it's got a bunch of new stuff mm -hmm. so. well the new 10th anniversary uh edition of the vec Tuari's graphic novel the fifth beetle the brian epstein story is now out and perhaps it could end up underneath your christmas tree but first let's um go back about a month we recorded this interview with vivek on october 23rd alan and i did and uh, let's go back and enjoy Vivek Tuari, our special guest on Things We Said Today. It's our very special guest on this special edition of Things We Said Today. It's author. I mean, I have a list here with your resume, and it's it'll take about a half an hour to read all this. Stuff. <laughs> so let's just say author, um, playwright, no. Uh, um, Broadway producer. Thank you. That's why Alan's here. To, to bail me out. It's my well, great pleasure to, to welcome to the show Vivek Tuari, uh, the author of the acclaimed The Fifth Beetle, the Brian Epstein story. Or is it Epstein? Are we going to go with Epstein or Epstein? Or is I, there wrong way? <laughs> we can have we can have a, a, a deep discussion about about this topic. But, right. but I will say this. The, the family uh, pronounces their name Epstein. So that's how that's how I've been calling it, and that that comes straight from uh, from Brian's mom. So that that's how the family has said it over the years. Um, that being said, you you can find plenty of uh, of footage of, of of folks like John Lennon saying Epstein, and right, Brian, and Brian not correcting them. So um, you know, I I don't think he was bothered by either. But the the family the correct family pronunciation is Epstein, right. Like Leonard well, Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein. He he. They <laughs> said Bernstein. You say potato, I say potato. Yeah. Well, this is the new edition of the Fifth Beetle. When you're watching this this Thanksgiving week, hey. Alan holding the original that was published exactly ten years ago this month, 2013, November 2013, and now we have the tenth anniversary edition, which is out. This week, Thanksgiving week, November 21st, 22nd, first in comic book stores, then in all bookstores. Uh, and the fifth Beatle has been expanded. As it says here, it is the 10th anniversary edition. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Vivek Tiwari to Things We Said Today. Thank you for having me. And it, 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 uh, I tell you, just reading about you in general, it's fascinating because this project, this Beatles project, this book, sort of, well, you're very involved with music, but, um, your thing is Broadway for the most part. 
But then there's this whole other island where you've sunk your teeth into the story of Brian Epstein. Um, and it's a story that should be that, that surprisingly isn't told enough. And you probably have nailed down a definitive look at his life. Um, tell us how you were involved in Broadway. The Beatles were always important to you. I know that having read about you, but how did, how did the Brian Epstein story come about uh, for you? Yeah, so you know, I, I uh, I'm so, I, you're right. I am certainly best known for my Broadway work, uh, but I do describe my my company more broadly. You know, we say that we we exist to shift the paradigm for music and entertainment, which is sort of a just a pretentious way of saying that we uh, we work with well known music and we try to find creative ways to present that music to music fans, whether that's taking music that you might not think belongs on Broadway and putting it in a Broadway show which is what we did with um, most recently with Alanis Morissette adapting Jagged Little Pill for the stage uh, in which it was not a bio about her life. It was a new and original story that we felt honored the themes of Jagged Little Pill. Before that, I worked with Green Day on American Idiot. Um, you know, so the, those types of shows that are certainly Broadway musicals um, by any definition, but but I like to think also kind of push the uh, the definition of what 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 is typically works on Broadway forward. Um, and I have projects that we're developing for film and television. So we we are really platform nimble is the way I, I also like to think of our work. So we're we're really, you know, I'm, I'm less uh, bogged down by what platform should a story be told in and, and more, you know, what's the music and, and what's the story that that music wants to tell. Um, so when you look at it in that, in that respect, you know, writing a graphic novel, uh, that's based on the life of a music manager. Um, it doesn't really, you know, feel that surprising for for the scope of what we do. Um, that being said, you know, I am a writer, and I, but I write very rarely. And this, you know, I'm I'm more often than not I'm a producer. And this was a particular labor of love for me. And and my passion for Brian really predates my company, my career. You know, it really goes all the way back. To when I to my college days, uh, you know, I I, um, I started. Uh, I was at the University of Pennsylvania in the Wharton School of Business, and I found myself on a track uh, to join my family businesses. I had established that I didn't want to be a doctor or an engineer, which was what was expected of me as a as an Indian kid, you know, a child of, of immigrants growing up in New York City with some opportunity. So if I wasn't going to do either of those things, I was expected to join my family business, which would have also seen me doing things that I wasn't passionate about. Um, the family businesses are, are sprawling and quite successful, um, but they operate in fields that, that I'm not passionate about, things like agriculture and finance and food. And, um, and I was always passionate about the arts. So I found myself in business school um, really, uh, you know, on a track to do something that I, I wasn't passionate about. Like many students and, and young people, I was, you know, conflicted in a lot of different ways. I, I didn't want to let my family down, but I also didn't want to necessarily follow the path that they put in front of me because then I thought I'd be letting myself down. And what I really dreamed about doing was, was having a life in the arts, was being an entrepreneur in, in the music industry. And, and that's, that's a, you know, I can I can tell that that that's another conversation. But in brief, you know, my grandfather, who started those family businesses that I mentioned earlier, he was a huge inspiration in my life. And he always told me, you need to work for yourself and you need to do what you love. Um, I suspect when he said work for yourself, what he meant was work for the family. But I took him pretty seriously. And growing up in New York City, I grew up surrounded by the arts uh, with music being my first love. So that was my dream. I said, I want to I want to work in music because that's what I love. And eventually I want to work for myself. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, you know, I, I thought if I'm at, you know, and I was at the Wharton School, as I said, in the early 90s and Wharton back then didn't have any resources for young people who were interested in, in careers in the music industry or in the arts. Um, you know, this was before the uh, the internet boom. And so they weren't even encouraging their students to go into new media or, or technology. It was all about invest, investment banking and finance and accounting. And to be fair, that's changed. Wharton now has a number of resources for the business of the arts. And in fact, I try to go back myself and guest lecture and be, be one of those resources. But back then there really wasn't anything. So I kind of found myself needing to study this on my own. 
I was a lifelong Beatles fan. I joke that I was listening to the Beatles before I was born because my parents were Beatles fans and they were playing the Beatles when I was in the womb. Um, so I was, you know, was born a Beatles fan. Uh, and I always thought that Brian and the Beatles were the team that wrote and then rewrote the rules of the pop music business. So wanting to get involved in that business, I thought I should study the, the life of, of Brian Epstein. And, you know, as you mentioned, there, there were no books available about Brian. The Fifth Beatle is the only book in print about Brian, graphic novel or otherwise. And, um, and so I started by reading every respected book I could on the Beatles. And back then, um, you know, there were, there were these 300 page books on the Beatles that had 10 or 15 good pages about Brian. Some of the Beatles books today have, have more on Brian, but nevertheless, he's, he's usually um, on the margins, you know, and, and, and very often those books have half truths or, or what I've learned was misinformation about Brian. But, but what they did provide for me was, was a portrait of the people who knew Brian best, his friends, his clients, his family, his enemies, his detractors. And uh, and what I did was I really just um, gathered a list of these folks. I focused on people who were either in New York, which was home, or Philadelphia, where I was at school. And then I just cold called them. And I said, I'm a, I told the truth. I said, I'm a student who's looking for more inspiration and dreaming of a life in the music industry. The little bit I know about Brian and what he did for the Beatles is inspiring. And would you please talk to me and tell me more? And, you know, I called people like Peter Brown, Sid Bernstein, Nat Weiss, who was, was still with us back then, who's still alive then. And, um, you know, many people warned me, oh, no, these folks will never talk to you. You know, Peter Brown in particular, I was told uh, he wrote a book about the Beatles and he doesn't do Beatles interviews anymore. He doesn't talk about Brian anymore. They'll never talk to you. And you know what? Like not one of them said no. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they all were more than happy to sit down and speak with me about Brian. And, you know, this was in the days before Wikipedia or YouTube or Google, you know, Google didn't even exist back then. So I, I kind of was forced in a lot of ways, very, very, very um, fortuitously so, to do these interviews with, with you know, in person. Uh, I guess I could have done some on the phone, but I, I, I like to be in person whenever I can, which again is why I focused on New York and Philly. And again, it was very fortuitous because slowly these folks became friends. You know, they they saw me, they could see that I was passionate and genuine. And, you know, at the time I wasn't writing a book. I was just, I wasn't even writing a term paper for school. I was gathering um, information from my own, my own personal passions and, 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 and inspiration. And, you know, initially I, I told, as I told you, I was a business student. I wanted the business right. stories. You know, I didn't care about Brian's personal life. I wanted to know how did he get a record deal when no one wanted to sign the band? Knowing my music history, I knew a British band hadn't made an impact in the United States before the Beatles. So how did he book them on Ed Sullivan? How did those things happen? Somebody had to be behind the scenes orchestrating that stuff from a business perspective. Um, and I did learn those stories and they are fascinating. But what really, um, the real revelation was when these folks started to tell me like, listen, if you really wanna know what made Brian tick, you have to understand who he was as a human being and, and le learning how he was gay at a time where it was against the law, how he was Jewish at a time of pervasive anti-Semitism. And certainly, you know, I don't wanna go off on too much of a tangent, but that's clearly uh, still, still an incredible problem in the world. Um, so I, I don't wanna suggest it was easier back then than it is now. Um, but it was was another one of many things that Brian was was dealing with. One of the many things he was persecuted for as a young man. He was from Liverpool um, at a time before the Beatles when no one was looking to Liverpool for the next big cultural thing, you know. And he was 26 years old. He was by, by all standards a kid. So in Brian, you've got this gay Jewish 26 year old kid running around a, a random port town in the north of England saying, I found a local rock and roll band who are going to be bigger than Elvis, who are going to elevate pop music into an art form, wh whatever that means. You know, people laughed at him. They said, th those, those dreams are stupid and people like you don't, don't do things like this. And, and that's what really clicked for me as a deep source of inspiration. Now, I would never claim that I had the obstacles in my life that Brian had, 
But as I mentioned, I was a child of immigrants. My parent family is originally from India. I was considered a weirdo Indian kid growing up in the, the Lower East Side of New York City. And that was my, my inspiration. I all of a sudden thought, you know, what if the gay Jewish kid from Liverpool could bring the world the Beatles and engineer Beatlemania? Then why couldn't a weirdo Indian kid from the Lower East Side write graphic novels and produce Broadway musicals and, and pursue those kind of dreams? You know, I, I always, I know I've been talking for a while, I'm sorry, but it's, it's a, it is a, a lengthy answer to the question. Um, you know, I always say that if there's one message to the Brian Epstein story, it's that no dream is too impossible and no person too unlikely to realize that dream. So that's kind of like how I came to the story and, and why for me it really is about Brian and not about the Beatles, even though I am a gigantic Beatles fan. Um, you know, this, this has a very personal and a human um, angle to it. So it's the other reason why 10 years on after the book's release, for me, it's, uh, you know, I, I couldn't be happier to be at this place. And I, I have never once thought of this 10 year anniversary as like a, a victory lap or as a, a something. Yes, of course, I'm celebrating, but it's not a matter of just celebration. It's like, it's an ongoing journey to get this message out into the world because it's a it's a message everybody still needs to hear. It's it's a human story about chasing your dreams in the in the face of adversity. So now I will shut up. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I saw Alan. You wanna you have something? Yeah, yeah. Want? I just wanted I just wanted to do a a, a second of um, amateur psychologizing here um, because um, although you're you're not Jewish and last time you were on the show you told us that you weren't gay, but you do have a family with a retail business that wanted you to go into it. And this there's a similarity there. I think there's a, a commonality with Brian there. Brian had his dream that he wanted to do. I mean, he had various dreams. It took him a long time to find, you know, the one that worked, which was the Beatles. Um, um, but, you know, it, I, I see sort of as you're telling the story, I just sort of see a similarity there, you know, just in that one aspect. So, no, look, and I really appreciate you saying that because because that that's how I feel, you know, but I, I just I also just on the same token want to be very sensitive to the fact that like Brian was gay when it was a felony. Like, I can't possibly know what that's like. I mean, you know, I, I married a, a woman who is half Irish, half Italian, and she she's she's white and I'm brown. And, you know, there were certain elements to that that was considered by many to be not OK. You know, so do I understand what it's like to to share a, a love of something that that might not consider be considered OK by everyone? I do. I could relate to that. Do I understand what it's like to be told your form of love is a felony? I don't. And I don't want to pretend that I do, um, you know, and and there's a lot, you know, there's, there's, you know, Israel and Hamas are at war because, you know, over issues that, that are connected to anti-Semitism. Do I really understand what anti-Semitism is? I, I have to be honest, I don't. But like, I was also grew, grew up a, a brown kid that was, a, everybody thought like, you know, when he grows up, if he does well, he'll be a doctor or an engineer. If not, like he might work in a deli or drive a taxi cab. Those were the kind of things that people thought about me growing up. So I can I can relate. So I, I really do appreciate you um, saying that, uh, you know, because I there are so many things about Brian's life that really struck a deep emotional, psychological chord for me. But but I also want to be very, um, very sensitive to, to, to some of the very serious issues that Brian faced and, and, and not pretend that I uh, I can understand all of it, if that makes sense. But you know the 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 gay aspect of Brian's story, you you um, treat really you know sensitively and sensi sensitively and in some detail here. Um, Thank you. And you know, uh, and and then also at the end of the book is sort of like an afterward. You have the essay on gay marriage, and oh. uh, you know, so it's it's um, it obviously was important to Brian and a a, a source of also immense pain in his life um, because of the degree to which it was illegal for, uh, I think most of his life, I think they legalized it in Britain before he died, didn't they? 
I'm not sure. I'm not it, sure what it, year. I mean, te technically, the Oscar Wilde laws were were repealed, um, ironically and sadly, just a handful of months before he died. But uh, but obviously that was this was in 1967. But obviously, just because the law changed didn't mean that that attitudes and and behaviors changed. Sure. Um, you know, certainly not within months after the law was was re removed. But you're absolutely right. It was literally right before he died. Yeah. Sorry, I to interrupt your line of questioning, Darren. Yeah. No, that's that perfectly. I'm enjoying sitting back here and listening to the two of you. I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney, reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you mentioned, uh, Vivek, that uh, initially you were reaching out to folks to learn about Brian the Man, not to write a book, not to turn it into yeah. a show, a movie, whatever. At what point, though, did you realize? Oh, yeah, sure. The story that has yeah. to be told. This has to be a book. And I'm fascinated with your and I will be I'm fascinated with your decision for this to be a graphic novel and not a traditional book. Yeah. Not, so, the, so, novel, not yeah. the graphic novels are a traditional, but it's a unique book in the, amongst, you know, uh, music uh, literature to have a graphic novel yeah, tell yeah. a story. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for saying that. You know, um, one of the things that I am proud of is that that we were maybe not the first, but one of the first sort of um, music stories told in the graphic novel medium. And over the past 10 years, you know, we're celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the book with this this new edition. That's one of the things that that's changed. There's there's many more now and graph, graphic novels in general. Um, it's been such a joy to watch how that that um, that medium has just grown. I mean, 10 years ago, you know, there were there were, you know, most bookstores you know, didn't know where to put this book. Like, does you know, they don't, they didn't have a graphic novel section and now many do, you know, and they were like, is it a, is it a comic book? Is it a graphic novel? Is it history? Is it, you know, the music? And, you know, we, our default would be like, put it under music, but it, but it's, uh, it's quite remarkable now that this, this is a, a medium that not just, you know, it's not just for, for comic books and fanboys and fangirls. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, but, you know, so so go going back, you know, rewinding to when I was was making these decisions. So it's true that when I started researching this story, you know, it was um, I'm going to date myself was when I was starting at school. It was in the early 90s um, or I'm sorry, the midnight. Yeah. Uh, the early. Night. Yeah. It was about, about it would have been around 92. Yeah. It would have been early 90s that I started doing this research. So, you know, a, a good like, you know, several decades ago and certainly decades before, um, you know, I had, I had graduated and started a company and and had a had a career path ahead of me. So, you know, I'd, I'd have to go back and do the math, but it was certainly like, you know, at least 10 years plus from when I became friends with these people that I called everybody back and I said, you know, now, now I have, have, you know, I've worked for graduated business school, worked in the music industry for a number of years for record labels, started my own company where we are platform nimble and, and doing a variety of things. And no one has told Brian's story yet. And I want to do it. So I want to take all, you know, I wasn't, you know, as you know, I wasn't lying when I set first sat down with you and said, I, I just want some inspiration, but here I am. And, and now I want to do something with, with all these, with this knowledge that I've, I've gained over the years. And again, I was very humbled that, that not one of them, um, you know, said, don't do that. Or, or, or uh, not, they all encouraged me. Not one of them thought it was a bad idea. They, they thought it's great that you, you should be the one to tell it because I wasn't there. So I do come from a little bit of an outsider's perspective, but I obviously am very passionate about the subject. Um, so, so they all encouraged me to do it. And, you know, I, I do approach every project that I do um, in this way that's platform nimble, where I, I think music comes first. 
and the story and narrative are, are a very close second. So in this case, obviously, it was a Beatles related story. And and I knew the narrative was about Brian's life. And, and then, you know, you figure out what, what's the medium for it. Um, at the time that I started working on the book, I, I had already had some successes on Broadway. So in some ways, doing it for Broadway would have been the easy thing to do because it was the medium that I knew most. Um, but as I started to think about how I wanted to tell the story, the first thing I decided was that I wanted it to focus on the years he spent with the Beatles. So 61 to 67, basically, uh, and hence the title, The Fifth Beatle. You know, obviously, like there's there's, you know, through backstory and exposition and dream sequences and other other mechanisms, we, we learn about his life before the Beatles. But I really wanted to focus on on those those years. Um, and I believe that, you know, 1961 to 1967 was a period of time where a, a black and white world burst into Technicolor. You know, that's mm -hmm. the way I thought of it, you know, and I, and I thought that this is also what the Beatles did for Brian. And, um, you know, if you if you look at the graphic novel, we, we followed through on that. You know, the first few pages of the book are are black, white, gray and, and blue, you know, and then when when the Beatles first appear uh, in the Cavern Club for Brian, Ah, uh, thank you for showing. Yeah, you see, it's it's almost totally black and white. And when they first appear, you get your first bursts of red and yellow and orange. And then by the time you get to, uh, yeah, there you go. So you get some red and orange there. And the, the the by the time you get to the end of the book, to Kyle Baker's sequence in, in the Philippines, it's we're on f full on Technicolor, you know. And, and that's what I think the world was like. You know, Brian, 1961 Liverpool was a dray grab industrial rainy place. And then the, the Beatles injected color into his life. And uh, and then Brian was, you know, with the Beatles was was an architect of the 60s, of, of what we think of as the 60s, the later 60s, you know, the, the summer of love, the psychedelic era, the, the, you know, the, you know, there, there was literally an event in the in 60s, in late 60s London called a Technicolor Dream it was a big festival there. So so right. to me, the story is tied into color, you know. And uh, and I believe that that the two media that that use color most effectively as a narrative tool are really graphic novels and film. And and I'm a lifelong comic fan. I have always wanted, you know, I I always I, I say that I'm pretty sure I learned to read by reading comics with my mom. My earliest memories of reading are reading Tintin and Asterix with my mom. Um, and so it was, you know, also fulfilling that kind of lifelong dream to 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 write a graphic novel, and and uh, and at the same time we did set off to, you know, to to do we, you know, we always thought we want to do a, a film or a TV show, but you know, filmed entertainment with this as well. That was always something we dreamed about doing, but um, but we wanted to start with a graphic novel because re really that part of it was just out of passion. You know, I'm a, I'm a comic fan from from the beginning uh, from day one, so. So that's uh, again another long answer to your question, but um, but very emotional reasons behind that one too. One quick question before I throw it to Alan: um, uh, the amount of work that goes into a story like this, writing a graphic novel, is is fascinating to me. It's remarkable because you're just not writing text. Now you have to get the art involved and the artist artists uh, yeah. to and and to work hand in hand with somebody. Who is visually telling a story and it has to match what you're what you're saying in words tell us about the process and who the other people are uh that are uh behind the fifth beetle yeah thank you for asking so i uh i can't draw to save my life uh and we're we're <laughs> very fortunate that we had two absolutely you know stunning artists on this book um, the most of the book is is um, painted by Andrew Robinson, and I and I and I do say painted um, because also very unusual for the comics medium. There there is a canvas, a literally a painted canvas for every single page of the book. Um, you know, in in the uh, in the um, supplemental materials in this anniversary edition, there's a a sketchbook that Andrew put together where he explains his process. Many of those canvases he then you know scanned and and put other um, you know computer techniques on. So not all of them are just purely painted, but every, one, every piece started as a painted canvas. Something we always dreamed about doing and never did is doing a gallery exhibit somewhere where we literally put the whole book on a wall, on wow. the walls, because you could with this one. Very unusual for, for comics. Um, but Andrew is that kind of an artist and, and he's just meticulous and, and uh, you know, he, he, um, he, he's the best. Uh, he's, he's one of the great artists in the comic industry. And then we used Kyle Baker, who's equally uh, a, a very 
you know, incredibly well-respected, multiple award-winning comic book artist. Kyle, Kyle can do anything, but he's, he's won many awards for his cartooning work. And, um, and, you know, that sequence, uh, there's a sequence, very specific little sequence uh, called uh, Chaos in the Philippines, which pays homage to the old Beatles cartoons, not Yellow Submarine, but the TV cartoons. Um, and I wanted someone um, to specifically do something very cartoony that was a departure from the rest of the book. Andrew can also do anything, but but I really wanted that sequence to feel like a jolt, like a different artist, different style. And so that's why we use Kyle for that. Um, I think this so, thing about. Yes, that's the sequence right there. So if you can see that, you can see it's a very different style from the rest of the book. Right, right. And we did that very specifically. And, and now that um, we're 10 years in, um, one of the things that we we did with this new edition is we have a new cover. And um, and with that cover, we wanted to do something that kind of paid homage to all the art in the book. And uh, Chris Brunner and Rico Renzi are the artist and colorist, respectively, who uh, who did that new cover. Um, and uh, Chris and Rico were, were literally handpicked by Andrew uh, when we set off to do this. A Andrew Robinson is um, is a very busy and in-demand artist these days. And, you know, he said uh, he said you should think about Chris and Rico for the for a new cover. And um, and uh, and Chris was, you know, was was thrilled to, to be referred. And, and uh, is also, you know, there's a there's a, a section that Chris uh Chris and Rico um, have in the in the supplemental materials where he also talks about Andrew being somebody that was a great inspiration to him. So it's nice that it comes full circle there. And you you held up the cover a few moments ago. If you you can see that it it also um, you know is it's sort of in some ways a cross between the styles. It's also got a lot of color in it and has a certain animated feel to it, but it's still also very photorealistic. So I like to think that the the new cover kind of pays homage to the art that came before it. Um, and so, so yeah, again, I was very, very fortunate to be able to attract these amazing artists to the project. Uh, you know, it was my first graphic novel, but for none of the artists, the artists were, were at their first. So in many ways, I was very lucky to work with people who'd really been there and done that and could, could bring a lot of experience and expertise to the process of making a graphic novel. So mm -hmm. um, just very thrilled that I had Andrew and Kyle to lean on on the way here and that we now have Chris and Rico um, providing new art for for this anniversary edition, right? Alan, okay, yeah, I was um impressed by the amount of um, uh, you know, supplemental material that you included in this edition, um, which kind of you know, you know, when you see a, a a book reissued in a new edition, you always sort of wonder, okay, like is this worth getting? Like, is there any new stuff? Is it, and but you know you. You did it, <laughs> um, Thank you. and including um, a playlist, <laughs> which yeah. is mm -hmm. sort of interesting. Yes. And as as you point out, you know, it, it's not all Beatles. It's not even all from the Beatles era. So um, that was really interesting. And I thought maybe you, you might want to say something about that. Oh, thank you so much for asking, because th this is the thing about the anniversary edition that I am most excited about. And, you know, I, I always think it's a little bit cheesy or sounds like a marketing line when you hear like director's cut or whatever. And people say, this is the version that I always intended it to be, but this is the version I always intended it to be. <laughs> the one that I really, you know, because it's, it's a, it's a music book and, and, you know, um, and so obviously music is, is in its DNA and, and Kyle and Andrew will tell you that like in many parts of the script that I wrote for this book, I, I suggested music cues like you would for a, for a film. And I said, you know, the, and um, so music was all, and, and Andrew and, and Kyle unsurprisingly are huge music fans and they had music that they were listening to when they painted the book. So, so music was always a part of the, of the story and clearly literally a part of the narrative of the story. So what we've done with this anniversary edition was we we put a, a playlist, a soundtrack together, if you will. There's a QR code so you you can, and we've also um, listed it out so you can scan it and, and listen to it through a DS, through a digital service provider like a Spotify. Um, or if, you, uh, if you're if you old school, you can you can uh, put, put your own playlist, you know, find it, pull, pull your CDs off the shelf because we do list what the songs are. And um, and and I've provided also liner notes because I'm old and, and dorky and geeky <laughs> like that. And I remember loving albums that had liner yep. notes. Um, but but as Alan pointed out, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't hasn't read the um, the anniversary edition yet. 
but uh, but there are, you know, there's a Bauhaus track in there. There's a Stone Roses track. There's a Sixpence None the Richer cover. You know, there there's all songs that are not. And there's look, there's obviously plenty of Beatles, but yeah. but there's also you know material that you might not might not think was intuitive. Um, Billy Holiday. There's a Billy Holiday track. Yeah. That's right. Um, oh, sorry. Let me see if I can. The Laws are here. Uh, there's a there's some Laws tracks. There there's a lot of a lot of tunes that that might. No, you might not think of ju just being, you know, Beatles music and music from the era. And so and so the liner notes explain why I chose all those songs, what you know, what emotionally they were trying to convey. And, um, you know, so I really hope that people will read the book and listen to the soundtrack while they're doing it. And, you know, this isn't why I did it, because because I really did have the soundtrack in mind from when I first uh, put the book out 10 years ago. But as we think about adapting it for, for a film or a TV show, it can also give you a, you know, you can immediately sort of imagine how music would fit into it and what that might sound like. So honestly, this, this is something I'm incredibly excited about for the anniversary edition, because it, it really is how I always hoped people would experience the book. Um, and, and really, thank you for saying that, Alan, because as a huge comic book fan, as a huge you know, fan of books in general, you know, I, I, um, you know, I am always a little bit wary when there's a new edition of something and, you know, always a little skeptical or are they, you know, just trying to squeeze an extra dollar out of a fan. And I really didn't want to do that here. And and I, so I, I really do hope that people will pick up this new edition, whether it's an old fan buying it again, or a, a new fan coming to the first time and, and, and see that, you know, we, we didn't do that. We, we really did want to provide enough material that, that, um, that it made sense to do an, a new edition, not just a new cover and the new cover is beautiful, but uh, yeah. in my opinion, and as I said, I can't draw to save my life. So I'm not patting yeah. myself on the back there, but um, it's more than just a new cover. It's, you know, there's a new introduction by, by Pearl Jam's man, longtime manager, Kelly Curtis. Right who was also inspired by Brian and was also one of my great heroes. Uh, you know, meeting Kelly Curtis was, was a dream come true. And over, you know, he, he's become a friend and, and unsurprisingly he was inspired by Brian. So getting Kelly to write a new introduction was also kind of a, a dreamy thing for me. Um, so anyway, thank you again, Alan, for asking that question. Cause it really, I, I do, I do really, I'm a fan of the supplemental material. I really am. <laughs> As yeah. much as I'm uh, also an author of the book, I I, I love the the new stuff that we're we're able to give you. Um, I was struck as well, you know, looking at the book again. I mean, I um I have to admit that in I read it ten years ago and hadn't looked at it that much since then. But you know, just revisiting it just reminded me that you know, while the story is told very, it's a serious story. You tell it seriously, but there's like these little. <laughs> little easter eggs of humor <laughs> like you know please please me gets to no number nine and george martin says number nine and the beetle each of the beetles says number nine and then you have a picture of yoko saying number nine <laughs> you know so it's sort of like uh you know it doesn't uh, to me it didn't detract anything it was just like nice to have a laugh in the middle of you know the serious story um thank you for that <laughs> did, the, did the main text change at all is 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 it's so it's no the main text has not changed at all so okay. so you know again we wanted to really make sure that the the new material was significant you know that there, that there was just volume a lot of new pages and and really mm -hmm. A whole new soundtrack because the main text has not changed you know we're the the story is the same and so you know if you're not really interested in in new material or in music you know there and you already own it i you, there's no reason for you to buy it again um i have and thank you for saying the things you said i i happen to think the new material is pretty great but the story yeah. is the same um and uh and i think um i'm really proud of that story i, I don't think it needed to change and um, so, so we, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of those kind of Easter egg moments for Beatles fans. And I, I, if you're a hardcore fan of the Beatles, I think you'll, um, you'll find a lot of, of neat stuff in it. And I, and I hope that you'll find more stuff as you revisit it, as you read it again and again. But I will say, you know, coming up on the anniversary, this 10 year anniversary, one of the things that I am really, really proud of is how the LGBTQ community and the Jewish community um, has embraced the book as a as a great 
you know, story of an LGBTQ hero and a great Jewish hero. And, and those were communities that weren't necessarily aware of the story going into it. So, you know, 10 years on, like to get the support of my, my Beatles family and the Beatles community obviously is a great joy, but to, to now know that, um, that those communities read it and, and, and felt that I told their story well, even though I'm not a gay man and I'm not a Jewish man, that I, I told it with sensitivity and in a way that they could embrace it as well. Um, that to me was, was a, a, a particular source of pride, shall we say. Yeah, I have one um, sort of like editorial decision question. Um, why create the character of Moxie instead of just making her Joanna Newfield or Wendy Hansen or or one of the other assistants? That, you know, just curious about that. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, so so there is a character called Moxie and she's a conflation of many people in Brian's life of, of Wendy, Joanne. She's a little Alistair Taylor. She's a little Peter Brown. She's, <laughs> she's got a, a, a lot in her, you know, and um you know, one of the main reasons was that I wanted to, you know, to keep the book, uh, you know, the 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 story pages, which, as we said, haven't changed to be pretty slim. It's, you know, it's 120 pages and you could read it in a in a pretty short airplane flight. Um, and, and that was something that I really wanted to do. I did not want to write a 300 page book about Brian Epstein that I know that that the three of us on this uh on this call would would have loved and and there are many other Beatles fans that would have loved it and and it might have sold enough books and justified its 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 uh existence but as i said at the beginning of this chat you know my goal here was to tell an inspiring human story and i wanted to reach people beyond just hardcore beatles fans or hardcore comic book fans um and i think that you know um, I've had the good fortune of spending time with with Peter Brown and and uh, and Joanne uh, Newfield. She's now Joanne Peterson, um, and and getting their 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 knowledge. And um, unfortunately, uh, you know, Wendy Hansen and and uh, Alistair Taylor, I did not get to meet before they passed on. Um, but uh, but I can tell you that these are people with rich stories of their own. Um, yeah. And uh, and in order to include them all as characters. I would need to really tell those stories I, to do them justice. And I, I wouldn't have felt comfortable just to having them come in and out as characters. Uh, and the book just, I didn't want that many pages, you know, and, and it is a graphic novel. It's not a biography. It's got fantasy sequences. It's got dream sequences. It's got a whole matador thing that's very surreal. And, you know, it's drew on my my love of filmmakers like Luis Buñuel and David Lynch. And, you know, that's uh, it's 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 art and it's got two artists working on it. So it, I want to be very clear about that. You know, that I wasn't trying to fool anybody. Um, you know, if you if you get to reading the afterward, you'll you'll see I talk about yeah, um, you know, the fact that she's Moxie wasn't a real person for those Beatles fans who may not know that going into it, you know. Um, so so there were a lot of reasons, but it was really creative, mission oriented, wanting to tell this story to people to not just be preaching to the choir, if you will. Um, and th those were the two big reasons, I guess. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, back to Darren. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, where do we go from here? I know that you have talked about there were plans in place. Maybe they still are in place to turn this into a television miniseries. Um, could it, I mean, being that um, one area of yours, which um, is near and dear to your heart is Broadway. I mean, where do we go from here with the, the Brian Epstein story? Yeah, so so if you've been following the book over the past decade, as the two of you have, thank you so much. Um, you will know that there have been uh, been lots of talks about film and television. Um, and, you know, for those of you who aren't in the industry listening to this, that might seem like a long time. But in uh, in Hollywood, things move at, a, at an awful sometimes at a very glacial pace. So, so 10 years on, um, it, it, look, it's long by any human standard, <laughs> but, uh, but we are still at it is all that I will say. And, um, you know, I, I, there, there, there's a, there's been a lot of rumors as to what the next steps are. And I, I, I don't like to talk about rumors. I, I don't like to announce something until it's really firm. So let me just say that, uh, that some of the rumors are true, but, uh, but what is definitely true is that, that I'm, we're still very passionate about um, adapting this for for some piece of film, whether it's film or TV, right. uh, you know, uh, 
there was a, a, a lengthy writer strike this year and, and that threw a curveball at us. The, the, um, there was also an actor's strike and, and that's thrown a curveball at us. So there were a number of things that just um, sort of derailed, uh, you know, plans that we had over the years. Um, but again, like having been in this business in, in, in January, my company, my, I will celebrate its, its 25th year anniversary. I've been working for myself for 25 years now. And, you know, I've, I've learned that, um, that, you know, you always, you don't, you never wish for a project to have to deal with these kinds of peaks and valleys in its development, but, but it's also not unusual. So, um, so we are still planning on it. It, it may still take a little bit longer before <laughs> it happens. Um, but, uh, but we want to do it right. You know, that's all I can right. say. If we're going to do it, if we're going to do it at all, we're going to do it right. Do it and if right. not, um, you know, we have this graphic novel that I'm insanely proud of. And that, that is, um, you know, celebrating 10 years on with, with new material. And, and really, honestly, right now, um, I'm not just, just saying this to promote the latest thing, but that is our focus is just like, let's just get this 10 year edition out into the world. Let people see this new version and hear what it would sound like with music. Let's focus on that. And then, and then we'll shift our, our, our focus back to, um, to other adaptations, but, but I can't help uh, being platform nimble, but think of other adaptations. So it's not gone away. That's what I'll say for now. Thank you so much Vivek for your time. Uh, and thank you so much for telling the story in such a unique way and such a fun way and an, uh, an attention grabbing way. The fifth Beatle, the Brian Epstein story. I, I, I've said it now both ways epstein and epstein in this <laughs> um and i i was gonna you know, make for myself at least be consistent uh so my consistent my consistency was that i was inconsistent uh but the brian epstein all good. brian heard it all in his <laughs> lifetime so you're you're consistent with the experience that he had uh there you go the 10th anniversary edition out this week thanksgiving week november 21st and 22nd and one day it's for just comic store launch and then all bookstores the next day Empress, the publisher division of dark horse comics no relation to dark horse records um and once again vivek tuari what a pleasure uh, getting to meet you and uh best of luck in the future Thank you so much for having me. And, and if you'll indulge me, I will just say that there are a lot of plans uh, coming. So, um, you know, if anyone wants to follow us, uh, you yeah. know, we are on all the social media accounts, both uh, Fifth Beetle as well as myself personally at Vivek J. Tawari. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We are on Twitter, although it's I guess that's not called X. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we don't post as often as, as we probably should, because, as I said, a lot of the stuff are still in rumor phase. But um, but do follow us and, and you'll hear the the um, the latest as, as stuff stuff unfolds. So thank you again for having me. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed that very special conversation with Vivek Tuari, the author of the graphic novel, The Fifth Beetle, the Brian Epstein story. The 10th anniversary edition is now out. If you have the original, you definitely want to get this one, because as Vivek was pointing out, there's lots of new things added to enhance uh, the story that was originally told about 10 years ago. And because we look different, and uh, Alan and I, that interview that you just watched was recorded about a month ago on October 23rd. And we wanted to bring it to you as a special bonus uh, for Thanksgiving week. Now, we have something else very cool that's sitting out there. Uh, and it is, you tell them, Alan, our new conversation with the great peter jackson um we talked about him and the earlier podcast we did on our 400th show a few weeks ago and uh darren said hey peter you know if you're listening you should come on again and Peter is actually a fan of the show and he was listening so he sent me an email saying i'm up for it and we talked to him again. The first time we talked to him right before the Get Back series came out uh, on, on Disney that, that he produced, um, that was a four-hour conversation. This time, Peter, the great producer of epic films, 
dialed it back slightly. This one is only like three and a half hours. <laughs> um, but also uh, an interesting thing about it was that he was uh, was playing us some of the isolations and tracks that his mouth system um, came up with for day tripper, just to demonstrate how it could take a, a track that had maybe three vocals on it and separate each of the vocals, separate Ringo's drums, individual drums from his kit, all that kind of stuff. And what happened during the show was that he would hold up his iPad to play it and the three of us would hear absolutely nothing until, so we finally told him about that. And, and then I sent him the clip and it turns out that Apple microphones, which he was using an Apple laptop uh, for, for the show, uh, haven't a noise canceling microphone because of zoom and other reasons. And so anything that isn't a voice, the Apple mic suppresses. So he's saying, okay, I'm going to play you the drums now. And he holds it up and we're yeah. not hearing anything. So what Peter decided to do was make an insert for us to put into the show. Um, and, you know, we expected maybe to just sort of do the tracks that he had played us. I mean, the, the whole segment was maybe what, three minutes, but no, Peter being Peter came up with a 23 and a half minute segment of playing, uh, you know, all four of the tracks from uh -huh. the EMI master. And then, I mean, not, not complete, just sampling. Um, and then showing it. Okay. This track has three vocals here are each of the vocals. Here are each of Ringo's drums. Here are the separated guitars. 23 and a half minutes. It was the best thing. So if you <laughs> haven't seen that one, it's episode 401. Check that out. Um, and the demonstration of the mal system and the track separations is at about two hours and 29 minutes. So if you want to fast forward to that. But we talked about all kinds of stuff. We talked about the now and then video. We talked about, um, you know, his hope to do something with the Star Club tapes, uh, really all kinds of stuff. So it was a great episode. Tune in and watch it. And if you want to see the original Peter Jackson interview from a few years ago, that is episode 355. So look for that. So you have a lot of, a lot of things we said today for your Thanksgiving table. Um, uh, Alan, you want to, wrap things up tell us how uh, how folks can find you reach you and and where you hide when they are finding uh reaching out to you sure um really the easiest way to get in touch with me is on facebook i'm there as either alan cozen or alan cozen remixed um you can write to all of us at things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's all right group email address we have a twitter feed which is at things we said fab and two facebook pages things we said today and things we said today beatles radio fans so there you go that's how to get in contact with me or with all of us and darren and i'm on facebook two facebook pages um you can shoot me a friend request at darren devivo or uh, go to uh, the other Facebook page and click like or follow, which is Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ and podcaster. Now, um, my schedule on the air at WFUV is a little uh, hit and miss on and off because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, I will return to the normal hours uh, that I have, uh, if you want to listen, uh, Saturday afternoons, one to four, and then Monday through Thursday nights. So this will be on the 27th of November, kind of gets back to normal. Monday, the 27th, you can listen uh, to me at uh, from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m., uh, Monday through Thursday nights. Don't forget the Saturday afternoon, 1 to 4, and WFUV is at 90.7 FM in New York City. Or you can listen on our website, WFUV.org. We have an app. I don't know if anybody goes to HD radio anymore. But we're at 90.7 FM HD, too, as well. And that's it. And Ken's going to be back. Ken's on the uh, Peter Jackson uh, you know, program. If, if you miss Ken, um, all of the information about how to get in touch with all of us and all of our various uh, you know, projects and Ken's uh, 
uh, other podcasts and his YouTube channel. All the information is in the um, information on the uh, on, on YouTube and mm. you know like that. So that you can just scroll down the the description of the episode. It will give all that information there too. So if you miss Ken, you can get his information there and tune into his other shows and get your Ken fix. We, we miss Ken ourselves. And hopefully uh, you enjoyed this conversation with Vivek Tuari. I'm sure the Peter Jackson uh, show you'll enjoy. And we have more. Uh, in fact, we're essentially ending 2023 with more interviews uh, uh, coming up in the, the next couple of weeks. So um, keep an eye out for us. And for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeVivo. And for Ken Michaels out there, and he's not meeting his parole officer. I'm just kidding. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you for watching Things We Said Today.